And so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Today we have, uh, we have three uh, fantastic speakers to talk about uh, digital transformation uh, during the era of COVID. So uh, Frank Konechny, Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Air Force, uh, Ying Chan, Chief of IT Operations for the City of Austin, Texas, and Robin Thottengall, Chief Technology Officer and Chief Data Scientist for the National Gallery of Art. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for uh, joining us to our audience. And so, again, sorry for the delay. We're going to just go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, we have uh, we want to we want to talk about the three different organizations, as diverse as they are, and uh, also how as progressive as they are in terms of digital transformation and uh, you know agile practices and, and lean transformation. So uh, why don't we go ahead and just uh, jump right into it, uh, Frank? Uh, why don't we start with you? Uh, talk about a little bit about your uh, digital transformation efforts and, and what's happening in the Air Force right now. Well, right now, since we had COVID, obviously you all know that we had a push for digital transformation of the collaboration platforms because that was necessary, first of all. Uh, you have to realize that we're a large organization. We have 160 to 300 locations across the world. And the problem space is always that we told everybody to go home. Now that's interesting, but most people don't have the capabilities, the, the, the laptops that are government issued to actually do that. <laughs> and so uh, with DOD, they developed a way of actually linking everybody together in a Teams platform, uh, which was not the, the highest classification level, but enough for us to actually talk with each other and get things done. So all of a sudden now we are all linked together in a certain way out there in the field. And this has become very interesting because now we can actually communicate with each other on a regular basis. And it seems to have taken a push to actually get digital modernization out there immediately. And also we have now doing various other activities for, you know, uh, public, uh, not public, uh, private orders or private laptops as well as private phones and everything else associated with this so we can have more connectivity besides the other specialized uh, communication devices that we have I mean, we have a special phone device for agents and things, but you know, that's not given to out everybody. It's too too expensive, anyways. <laughs> but, that, but that pushed us to to that. Also pushed us to actually saying, not only in the Air Force, we all should be on the same cloud platform, same email platform, and everything else. And so there's a big push right now to to modernize to that particular platform, particular platform, and the way we want to look at it. And I think that was necessary because all of a sudden, you know. I mean, in COVID land, uh, well, before COVID, let's put it that way, everybody had to be in the office all the time. I mean, telework was a, a privilege that you'd use when it snowed, you know, and uh, that was about it. And now it's like, uh, everybody, nobody expects you to be in the office anymore. I mean, it's an anomaly. I just talked to somebody and they were like, well, if you're, if you're in here and you're not in, you're only going here for meetings and you're gonna sit at your desk and you know, do telecoms, why don't you stay home? <laughs> and that's what, you know, we seem to be doing now telecom zoom sessions and everything else is is the norm right now for for what everybody's doing and i think that's that's helped a lot to everybody get used to getting work done i think you know when we talk to everybody else i think we're getting more work done now than we did before it's also exhausting us but uh and we have to think about you know burnout in the digital age now <laughs> because we don't travel anymore, <laughs> you know? There's always that little break between, you know, meetings and you can walk around. Well, there's no break anymore between meetings. <laughs> and I think, you know, we're all experiencing that right now and it's, it's, uh, it's frustrating at times. In fact, I had a half, half an hour today that was, was canceled and I was overjoyed. I had a half an hour to do something else. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so Ying, uh, from a totally different perspective, local government, city of Austin, Texas, how have things changed for you? So much, um, definitely we have all the things that Frank sees at the Air Force, you know, our, our workforce now is, is remote primarily and, and unlikely to return for a majority of them that can do that. Of course, um, about a third of my workforce is essential services. So we support the emergency operations center and you gotta be there for that. Um, you know, we support public safety and you got to be at the firehouse, you got to be at the police station. So you got to, you got to be there for that. And then we also support outfitting all the tech and all the vehicles, um, in our fleet and across the city. So, you know, we have to be on site for that. Otherwise, you know, um, I would say a majority of our folks are now going to be 80% or better working from home. We only have 
a minority coming in in any significant amount of time at all. So everything that Frank describes, um, we are definitely seeing. Um, but it's affecting us um, across the board um, from the services we deliver. We don't, you know, we have some grand plans to build out uh, megaplexes, if you will, you know, where folks can come for one-stop shopping. You know, if you ever built anything in a city, you'll know that you need, you know, 123 permits to do anything. Um, so it used to be that you needed to go to every department and, you know, we were, had these dreams of building these, you know, not dreams, you know, we still are doing it, um, but the pressure is a lot less. So we were building these one-stop shop, you know, if you need a permit, you come to one building, you know, um, um, you know, we're known for, for doing some really great architectural work here at the city. Um, you know, we have this beautiful building, beautiful lobby, just reimagined, uh, you know, the, the customer service aspect of it and the engagement. Um, but now that's changing again right, to be primarily online, right, you know, you don't need to come in to get your permit, um, you know, then, then by, by, by all means try to do it online. So we're seeing a lot of our services, having a lot of discussions about uh, how to do that. Um, scheduling, believe it or not, is becoming a, a pretty big topic. So, um, you know, if you think about a city um, from, you know, golfing to adopting an animal, it's all walk-up service in the past, right, you know, you wanted to you know, go to the animal shelter, adopt a pet, you just walk up. Well, now all that's got to be scheduled, right? You can only have, you know, 25% occupancy, the staff can only see so many folks a day, right? So, you know, you have to have PPE. And, and so, so scheduling has become quite a topic for us across the board. Um, again, from recreation to, you know, again, animal adoption to, you know, um, if you do have to come in and interview for, you know, health service or, um, you know, housing or, um, if you're a food risk, um, you know, and, and we're helping you out with that, you know, so, so that's another one that's, that's kind of a, a, a surprising, but um, definitely if you think about it, um, a natural progression of the, the new normal. So, so we're seeing it in the services we deliver. We're seeing all the things that you see with a remote workforce. Um, and then, of course, the big one for us, um, I think for everybody is also just a because of the way we're engaging, the security footprint is changing and it's changing rapidly. Thank you. Well, Robin, back to the federal level, but in a completely different setting, uh, can you talk about your, uh, what, how, you, how your organization is responding to COVID? Oh, you're, you're muted. Let's see. Oh, so much for a seat here. There you go. <laughs> um, nice to see you, Frank, again, and Ian, good to talk to you again. Uh, one thing I was thinking about it is thinking, other than the collaboration, one of the things that we have challenges, you know, we are a museum, we expect close to 5 million visitors walking through the gallery space throughout the year. On average, we see 10,000 people walking in, right? March 14th comes around and we are saying that we are going to be closed. So workforce-wise, we have to start thinking about how do we change our business process to adapt where we cannot walk down the street to think about conservation versus what kind of exhibitions or how we are going to move the space. So that has take, taken a hits on life. And on the other side, what I see interesting from a visitor perspective is the gallery is starting to understand that there is a new world out there where digital is the way to engage. So one thing we did was we did a virtual reality of our Dega, like which, which was an exhibition that we were expecting a lot of visitors to come and enjoy the show on site. So in addition to the, 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 the desire for becoming more collaborative in the digital space, from a visitor perspective, the gallery is starting to realize that digital is another way to engage and see visitors. Not that we didn't have a digital presence before, but now it has become more prominent than the previous cases. So people are starting to think about how do we build virtual reality-based shows or how do we make sure that we have much more um, unique ways of telling the story of our exhibitions to a visitor who cannot probably come and see the space now. So that's that's the, the addendum to what you know, Frank and Ian has been seeing, like that, that desire and understanding on the fact that digital is also another platform for us to engage with our customers. Great, well, so uh, you were just talking about um, you know, the, the traffic that you get at the, in the museum uh, and how it was before. And so I'm, I'm interested in the others um, you know, your, your path to digital transformation, you're known for being, uh, you know, progressive in this area. What was it like before uh, the pandemic came along? What was your path? And then the second part of that uh, is, uh, 
how, how things change permanently. So maybe, uh, Frank, we could start with you. Uh, how, you know, talk about digital transformation, uh, you know, before COVID. I mean, the path was always, you know, we're going to go to the cloud. We're going to move, migrate our applications. We're going to have, you know, communication networks. I mean, we're working with uh, pushing out 5G for some of the bases right now, as well as ATE. LTE rather, and you know, it's a progression path. And I think that is the standard way of looking at it. We have to update our comm and we have to make sure, you know, we service the people, service the airmen out there. And I think that's what, you know, everybody was trying to do. And now, you know, with COVID, you know, and Robin mentioned something too about AR or VR. We're, we're trying to do that now more for classrooms because they can't be next to each other anymore. <laughs> so pilots and everybody else, we were trying to separate them into different rooms now. And so you need an AR or VR con connection to actually train these guys because they used to be in the same room working with each other. Now they're not anymore. So, so I think, you know, classrooms are changing. And I think, you know, the education process for us is changing too as it's progressed. And that was, that's kind of interesting that we never thought about, when we thought about doing this before, but never to the degree of which I believe we are trying to exceed and do it now. And I think the push is, is, is good. I mean, it's, it's an interesting push, but it's fast. And I think uh, fast is always good, but also dangerous. <laughs> and so you gotta be careful of what you, what you do and uh, be careful of it. But that's, you know, slow and steady before, fast and semi-steady and maybe reckless at times, but trying to get to be innovative and get it out there to meet mission sure. requirements. Sure. So um, can you give us a glimpse of what's permanently changed? I know you can only talk so much about uh, certain things, but just in terms of, um, you know, you just alluded to the, the pilots that now have to be in other rooms. Uh, what, what are some, um, when I think of the Air Force, I think of a lot of people, a lot of logistics and just a lot of equipment and so much going on. Can you describe what it might look like permanently going forward? Well, maintenance wise, you know, you can't, can't repair, pain, repair, repair planes virtually. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta have people out there. What we're trying to do is uh, the modernization was always look at predictive maintenance for the planes. And we have some pilots now it's a big deal. Now we have a whole slew of pilots from written maintenance for the planes, as well as determining what parts have to be sent to the, to the maintenance guy right away, as well as having some support for uh, having a, a SMEs with AR, VR be able to help the particular maintainer if they don't know exactly what to do. So there's, there's been a, a revolution. I mean, it's always, it's always been there. We've always had digital air force of the future. We've had, flight line of the future capabilities is just a question now we really need it and now we had to push it out because we can't bring in the maintenance staff that we used to bring in it's not happening so and they rotate hours and you know you can't get the same person that has the experience now there all the time so we have to resort back to you know calling a friend and making sure that we can get them online from their home and actually get the maintenance activities done so logistics is a big deal logistics is changing I think, you know, uh, training's changing, logistics changing. Uh, the way we actually manage uh, online capabilities now, everything is online, really. We're getting to that point now where, and even when we talk, talk to the uh, personnel center, personnel center keeps on, are now, you know, we can chat with them. <laughs> we couldn't do that before. <laughs> we can chat with anybody, we can call them up, we can have a video chat, you know. So I, I think that, you know, the world is changing into this environment that we all are looking at each other via, you know, terminals at home now, as opposed to actually meeting with each other and inter interacting with each other. Great. Okay, well, Ying, um, question for you. I think of uh, Austin, Texas is one long South by Southwest festival that's ongoing and uh, the funnest place to be. I know that's not really true, but um, how, are, how are things different, uh, you know, than, uh, well, first, how, how you know, your, your path to digital transformation before COVID, if you want to get into that, and then the second part as well, how, how have things changed permanently? Yeah, so, so you know, just to be fair to, to everybody, you know, life in Austin is one big South by Southwest, it never ends, so, you know, I'm sorry if it doesn't in your city, but in Austin, you know, it's, no, it's not true. So um, digital transformation for us previously is, is, is the same, um, much more in the same as, as, as what Frank was mentioning, you know, 
um, going to the cloud. Um, you know, we were definitely always kind of sharpening our saw with, with security operations. You know, the, the vectors are always changing um, and the push is always changing and when we're getting probed and, um, and poked, you know, when it comes to security. Um, one of the big things that we were doing in the city was changing our IT focus to be um, a technology services organization that was focused on outcome and really changing our customer um, engagement, you know, having a really good experience um, with an IT team. And, and I think you've all heard all the, the typical, um, you know, uh, legacy IT kind of comments, you know, the organization to know and, you know, you know, organization never gets anything done. So we're, we're pretty much on a push to change that already. But to Frank's point, um, what COVID done is done now is accelerated everything. You know, everything is, is now needing to go faster. Um, so even some of the stuff that were temporary, so just work from home, you know, you know, we just talked about this the other day, we're pretty much on 3.0 of that, um, of that already, right? We started with, you know, just in a week, we enabled about 15,000 folks to work remotely, you know, that, you know, and, and we had a lot of things that, you know, you know, put my files out there, just non-optimal things that, um, you know, just to get the folks away from the office and get them segregated, you know, get them isolated and, and social distancing. Um, and then in the 60 days or so after that, you know, we kind of instantiated that, you know, we shrink, you know, we shrunk our VPN footprint from two solutions to one and kind of, you know, hardened that, um, you know, hardened that, um, that whole offering of, of working remotely. And now we're crossing a budget year and now we have a chance to procure, we're actually buying new solutions and, and you know, and further hardening, right? And, and instantiating, making a permanent now offerings that we do, right? So even that in rapid succession over the last, um, I would say, you know, six months or so or five months or so since March, right? We've gone from, you know, just making it happen to hardening it and, and standardizing on some tools, right, to now procuring that new solutions, right, preparing for this is the way of the future, um, to Frank's point. Great. Okay, well, Robin, you've already talked a little bit about the, the pre-state, but I wondered, wondered if you have anything to add, you know, what was the museum doing in terms of digital transformation pre-COVID, if there's anything you want to talk about, I'd be interested in, in hearing uh, anything else you have to add. I mean, you know, other than I think everybody seems to have the same issue taking everything to one, one cloud platform and all those things is the same for us. But when I look at back and see what changes has happened in the last couple of months because of this, this um, situation we are at ease, one thing that the gallery was very much, um, um, intra, very much always focused on is perfection. Because if you have any of you have gone to the gallery, you see that it's very clean, very, you know, there is nothing dis misplaced. So that comes, that behavior is all, always there when you think about technology adoption too, because if you have to build something, you have to sit through six to eight months of convincing on, is this the right solution? And this is why this is the right solution, right? Now what has happened is because of COVID, people does not have that many, time, that many hours to burn slash they cannot wait to say that we will think about it in another meeting because we have been trying to do indoor positioning within the gallery and I've been trying to do that for the past six months. But COVID hits, then we realize that next time when the visitors walk into our gallery space, they are not going to be interested in having a device handed by the gallery. They prefer using their smartphone, which means we should be able to tell them where they are standing within the gallery space so that they can get the right data into, the, into their device, right? So now, there is a faster adoption from the entire leadership to say that, Robin, tell me what do you want, how much money you want, we will give you everything you want to build that capability. And so I think what I am seeing happening is this COVID is changing the behavior of the organization from not just saying we are interested in agile to actually embracing that thing. And to Frank's point, now the problem that I have is not be reckless. Right, because now everybody wants to fail fast, but we have to make sure that, okay, fail fast does not mean you just go to the deep end without even learning how to swim in the three feet pool fast, right? So that is the, that is the challenge I have these days, making sure that we want to fail fast, but make it, do it in a responsible fashion, unless it becomes a reckless act of doing something for reacting to a situation. And another one I was thinking about is, 
access your internet from outside your VPN, probably never heard of, right? Now people are like, we made it happen so that people can submit their timesheets because I, didn't, I don't need to be in VPN anymore. I can just go to telework.nga.gov, authenticate using my AD, and I can do my timesheet. Think about that conversation six months ago. There is no way they will allow you to do that, right? So I think that's, that's the kind of changes that I see happening. Great. Well, so uh, you just mentioned something uh, related to my next question. For, this one's for you, Robin, to, to follow up. Um, in terms of, of agile or lean practices, uh, it seems like, uh, well, you know, there's so much uh, that's unfortunate and unexpected in this situation. Uh, you know, as everyone has alluded to, you know, um, we're all being pushed uh, in this new direction. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, Robin, if you could talk about agile. How, how are you being pushed more toward agile or lean practices? Or do you have any kind of success stories that you can share related to um, you know, add more agile, working with your teams or solving problems or, or whatever? I mean, you know, one thing that comes to my mind is gallery was never um, an organization that had tickets for the visitors, right? But when the COVID uh, happened and when we reopened, I think we are the first museum to reopen in the mall, we realized that we have to calculate occupancy. So one way to manage occupancy is to Ying's point, scheduling, right? Only way we can schedule is start having, giving tickets to people to say that how many people are allowed at any given point of the um, hour, per hour basis. So one of the interesting thing that I saw was we had access to a platform first. We used to, we have used Eventbrite before and we started using that immediately without worrying about is this the platform for the organization in the long term, right? And then now what we are doing is we are asking the question, is this platform meeting all our needs? Do we need to pivot and invest in the platform? And we are finding out that the, platform, the current platform has its limitations. So this is a classic example where I have seen the organization adopting a solution that is available immediately and not worrying about meeting all the expectations and then coming back and say, okay, let's reevaluate, right? So that is one success story I can see, like, you know, we are pivoting from that platform in the next 60 to 90 days which was never seen before because the gallery will not do that, right? So I think that's one success story where I'm seeing people moving from one platform to another for a stable solution, but they are not shying away from using what you have immediately to solve the immediate needs. Great. Okay, Ying, uh, same question for you. In terms of success stories and agile, any, anything you wanna share with us? So, so two actually. So, so we have been, you know, moving towards more of an agile approach. Um, you know, most of our problems have been solved before. So, you know, we're not a giant organization, you know, that, that have massive development teams. So when we say agile, you know, we don't real mean hardcore SDLC, right, agile, but we do, you know, solve problems iteratively, you know, we do organize ourselves in scrums and, and we do stand ups and, you know, so we adopt the agile processes and actually we're starting to morph that as we become more and more of a business process reengineering, you know, delivering technology services rather than, you know, a technology object per se, an application or a computer, um, you know, we're, we're taking more of a lean um, type approach, right, and, and, and having, you know, some of those artifacts, right? Um, value stream mapping and, and really talking about the value chain and, and looking at outcomes and, and mapping that back. Um, so that's, you know, from a process standpoint, right? That's an interesting um, thing that's developing. From an actual practical in the field aspect, right? We've been called upon now to, to react very quickly in the field, both on a um, operationally um, on site with testing and, um, you know, mobile testing and, and, you know, going to, uh, to, you know, to, to um, schools and going to other locations to do testing and, and get that um, testing mobility out there. Um, we've also been now asked to respond at the same time to the protests. We've been asked to respond, you know, last week we did a whole evacuation where the destination, evacuation destination for Corpus Christi and and Galveston, which was evacuated. So we had to mobilize and activate last week. Um, so, you know, in terms of developing solutions on the fly, right, we're learning our tools and we're able to put, um, you know, 
solutions out there that may not hold for, for several thousand, right? Um, you know, um, residents, but they'll hold for, you know, six, 700 and we'll get through today and then get a bigger solution or iterate that solution, right? To meet, you know, the demands, you know, instead of in the old days, it would be like, well, you know, we potentially need um, a software that handles 5,000 evacuees, right? So let's, you know, wait and build that, right? And, and we'll never get it done. We end up writing everything on paper. So now we're, you know, hey, we got 500 coming. What can we throw together, right? We do that and then, you know, we look on ETN and there's another four buses coming and another, you know, so we, you know, we would kind of iterate, right, as the situation's developing. Um, so it's actually moving on to the field, right? And the technology, has become a, a very critical part of our activations um, on site, not just with um, communications um, enablement, right? You know, Wi-Fi, cell phones, and printers, and, and stuff like that, but also um, the software itself, right? You know, we're developing things literally on the fly, right, to meet the situation at hand, and then expanding it, and just having the faith, right, and the, and the confidence that you know we can take it from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 to, to 5,000, right, in, in more of a just-in-time manner. Great. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, Frank, uh, same question for you. Uh, success stories related to Agile. Um, also want to add one uh, twist to that as well for you. Um, in terms of um, teleworking, you know, remote working, um, does it lend itself more for Agile methodologies? Um, just, you know, if you could start with that one. That's a good one because you think yes and no. It all depends. And it all depends if you have a chat window open or a Skype window open, you can communicate with your people at the same time. I think that that's, I mean, a lot of times when you say the programming environment, people are sitting at their, their desks or their cells or whatever, and they're typing away, but they have to have that, that window where they can communicate with people all the time. And I think that's what keeps them going. It doesn't matter where they are. It's just a question of communication and making that available and saying, I have, a, I have something here. I want to team up with you to talk about, you know, what, what the problem I have here and get some suggestions from the team. And I think that's, so I guess it would be, yes, it would help, I guess. It makes them more comfortable because half the time they're actually doing that anyways, <laughs> especially at night. So it's, it's in a question of, you know, how to actually support all that activity. Now, for uh, DevSecOps and things, we, we've done it. Uh, we, we got into this, but I pushed it for somebody else to, to actually start this because we had a, we had to modernize a piece of uh, software. It's a very complex piece of software, the Air Operations Center, which consists of about 30, 30 40 applications. And uh, the modernization was gonna cost too much <laughs> because it was the vendor that was doing this and they came in and we said, you know, the billions that you want, we can't afford. And so we said, okay, what can we do internally for secure applications that are essential for particular missions? And so we set up a uh, DevOps environment. Uh, we experimented with airmen who never programmed before. We brought in another team of contractors that would actually teach our guys how to work. And it was a success. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a tanker refueling project and what happened was they were doing the tanker refueling just on a whiteboard and it took them 12 hours to figure out the tanking refueling schedule for the next day. So it was a real, it was a real simple task or not simple, complex in terms of scheduling, but it was a simple task or to say, you know, you're not replacing anything. We're just doing it new. And we're going to test this out and see if it really works. And within like three, four months, they had the system running. And that was unusual because if you were never a contracting environment with government, Nothing happens in three months, barely happens in three years. <laughs> so, you know, this was like a shock. How could this actually work? You know, and, and so it has progressed from that. We have like 10 software factories across the United States now doing this because it's worked so well. And, and it's essential that we understand that it's, it's not for everything. It's not for every application. <laughs> There's some things we require for, you know, DevSecOps for large vendors as well now. And they're saying, yes, we expect you to do this because we want to see some agile results coming out and we don't want to wait for two years before you deliver something. And so I think that's now being inundated into the culture of what we want to see between our doing it ourselves for key mission applications, as well as for large applications that we normally get a prime for, you know, 
forcing, well, not forcing per se, but requiring that they actually do this so we can get some feedback into the system, the development system right away. And then of course, we've gone a little farther. We've actually uh, tried to do a authority to operate immediately based upon the tools that we have in the platform, which generates lots of the information for the risk management framework automatically based upon the, uh, the tools that we're using, the testing that's automatically done, everything else. And we're finally doing a, for some of these, we actually do a pen test at the end and keep it going to make sure that what we think is okay is really okay based on the test that's actually occurring automatically. And so we've been progressing pretty much down the path now saying, yes, this is really working. And uh, we need to do it more. In fact, we're trying to train more people now, trying to train airmen to they be digitally aware of what's going on and can understand this. And the latest thing is we have lots of robotic process automation things coming out now. Since we don't have the people sitting around now, <laughs> it's how can you replace them? Place them and have them do something else that's more mission oriented because remember, they're only coming in half the time now. <laughs> so we got to make sure that they're, they're productive, you know, all the time. And so we've gone down that path of, uh, of looking at other tools that could actually be utilized in the digital environment that we actually push out there and actually save time and get things done uh, just as well. Great. Fascinating. Okay. Well, uh, folks uh, on the line, we, um, we're going to take questions, uh, put them in the, the chat feature, uh, and uh, uh, we'll make sure our panelists uh, get to answer your questions. So think about those. Feel free to post them anytime. Um, so I, I usually ask this question uh, about the, uh, the struggles before the success question, just so we end on a more positive note. But, um, but I did want to ask about uh, the struggles. There's obviously been so much happening in the space. And um, you've already talked a, a lot about um, your struggles, but I was wondering if you know you could focus on you know what's been something that's been uh, unexpected that uh, that you had to overcome in this whole COVID situation. And Ying, why don't we start with you on this one? Yeah, so I think Frank mentioned it before. Definitely, burnout um, is a thing, right? Um, you know, folks get up and there's no more commute, so you know. As much as we hate commute, it is a break in your day. It is a different activity, right? It is something different. And, and our days are made up of different structured activity, right? Now there's one big structured activity and then the work, right? Um, so, so we definitely see that. Um, the collision of parenting, right? And, um, and work, right? Uh, the push and the pull has been, uh, it's been a struggle, right? We have a, a lot of um, young families with, with kids that are now you know, um, studying from home um, remotely or not even not remotely, you know, daycare is not available. Um, you know, the classes are online and, and, you know, most of those require um, some discipline, some homeschooling um, aspect to it, even though the, the classes are quote unquote online. Um, the kids themselves are now, you know, parents are, are, are feeding back. The kids themselves are a little burnt out. So it's, there's additional, I guess, you know, second order or third order um, kind of associated issues um, with that. Um, so, so that's definitely something that, that wasn't really anticipated, um, you know, and then um, the longevity of COVID-19, you know, we're, we're now starting to really, I mean, we talked about it, but now we're actually starting to, to see it and experiencing and, and, and capturing new things. You know, we said that, hey, Memorial Day and, and reopening, we would see a spike and how you know, what would we have to do to kind of respond to that, right? So we saw that and we now that we got that under control, you know, we've got flu season coming up, we've got back to school, we've got Labor Day weekend, um, you know, again, we had the unexpected, the, the protest response, um, you know, of course here in Texas, you know, we did anticipate and now it's playing out the, um, the, um, um, hurricane response, and, and there's also a, a wildfire element out there. I know my friends in California are struggling with the wildfire response. Um, so we're getting, you know, event on top of event on top of event. So, so that's been interesting. Um, the upside of that, um, to Frank's point earlier, is it's, it's forcing us to really look at our, our resiliency um, as a city and as a state and, and also the processes and the technology we have to responding to incidents right and now um you know being re-looked at and and you know we're we've never faced a situation where we'd be activated for months right so you know for example the 
evacuation activity was a flurry of residents last week, and we've got some cleanup this week, but in, in all essence, right, in two weeks, you know, one of those responses is over, right? Normally, you'll see would, you know, wind down and, you know, go back to, you know, quietness and then, you know, but now, you know, it's on and on and on. So we're, we're reinvesting and, and re-looking at, um, you know, our, our business processes in terms of emergency response resiliency and then the technology investment that goes with that. Okay, thank you. Robin, uh, you want to add to that at all? Uh, how have you had to overcome uh, in this situation? I mean, you know, I think uh, Ying, when you mentioned this, it was funny. I was catching up with one of my long-term colleagues recently, and he mentioned the same challenge because he re now he loves, he, he's thinking about the time he can commute again, right? Because he was thinking that there was a time between me being a professional and me time than me being a dad and a, a husband, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a struggle. So I think one thing we have been doing very uh, proactively was in the organization, we are proactively telling the staff that, okay, it's okay if you have to take some time to take your kid while you know, they have been homeschooled, right? So we are being very careful with making sure that staff feel like it's okay, we understand your struggle, so don't feel like you have to sit in your chair from nine to five, like the expectations are different. So I think that's one thing that I have seen changing with respect to COVID because that translates to a completely different way of thinking because some of the managers are starting to realize that I can my staff like this. I may have to be a bit patient getting access to them, right? So that's one thing I was thinking about from a struggle perspective, what the gallery had to go through in the workforce and how we have changed that. Now, Frank, to your point, I was thinking about Slack, right? Because if you talk to developers pre-COVID, they will say, I don't know what you're talking about. I used to use Slack for working with people across the world every day, and I, I used to have that chat. Now, what is happening is since we are like dispersed and we have to work on some of these efforts, platforms like Slack is becoming a normal norm. But the struggle there I see is people who has never been used to the digital platform is trying to get onto that platform and trying to make them understand that putting something in a channel is not equivalent as putting in a shared folder and sharing the link, right? So some of the issues are very fundamental, trying to help them understand that you, if you want this to be persistent, you have to do it this way in the digital world, right? Versus you just want a quick snapshot, you can put that in the Slack channel and you will see it, but it's, it's not going to be accessible anymore, right? So those are the things that is, I think is happening, but I think the positive side is, I hope that we come out of this, this whole event becoming more digitally um, educated to work as a workforce. That's my hope. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Frank, uh, you've talked a lot about your challenges. Anything you wanna add? Yeah, there's, there's a few more things. <laughs> but one of them is, uh, which we found out today, it was kind of interesting. I was talking to somebody else and I didn't realize that uh, she was actually working everything from a pad for the last six months and going blind. So I was like, okay, you're using a pad. Why don't you get something else? And it was like, well, I have to go back in the office to get something else and I'm not going back. You know, so we're like, okay. So I think, you know, the equipment issue is starting to affect people. They thought they could get by with certain things and now they're realizing that that's not gonna work for them in the long run. You know, and I think that's one of the issues that we never thought about that, you know, we said, Pat, get pads to everybody. It's be fine, they'll be okay, you know. And that that is is probably going to affect us going for your future because we're going to have to buy more equipment or buy different equipment. And like at in at the uh, the office, we have you know large monitors and everything else associated with it. At home, she revert back to a pad. I'm like, you are going blind, aren't you? And so, that's the stress and strain of you know working from you know home with inadequate equipment. And I think that's going to be the big issue. And burnout is always the big issue. I mean, we go this a lot. It's a question of, uh, and also there were, we're missing some social activities. Now we've had, we've had retirements, we've had promotion ceremonies, we've had all these, we're starting to do these, you know, vid virtually and we're kind of getting the idea now. <laughs> you know, we can see, you know, people complimenting each other in, in, you know, in chat and everything else now and of joining the party, you know, and everything. So I think that we're finally getting to a, a arrangement where we realize it's just going to be, it's going to be like this. 
are going to have to communicate more in different ways as opposed to actually showing up with each other. And I think that's been the real adjustment that's happening right now. And people are, some people can't cope with that at all. I mean, it's either I talk to the guy or I congratulate him now, or, you know, he's going to leave and I don't know what I'm going to do. Because all you can say is a few words in a chat and, and you can do it, you know, via Zoom or something else. But, you know, after that, it's, it's impersonal. And I'll tell you something else that's also interesting to us. We get a, a, a whole range of new people coming in because it's a, it's a season, you know, every PCS is on. Yeah. And I haven't seen some of these guys' faces yet because they're always in masks. <laughs> so if I met somebody, has been a guy in the hall, I will not know who that person is unless I look at his nameplate and see, oh, it's you. <laughs> you know? So this is kind of a weird situation that we're getting into now that, you know, masks are, every, are everywhere now. And so it's a requirement. So I guess everybody's kind of hiding behind masks a little bit. Eventually, we're going to get to that point where we can see each other again. But I think it's, you know, it's a different way of looking at social activities that we're going to have to cope with at some point in time. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, so uh, my next question, I want to I want to see if anyone uh, of our attendees have questions, folks, please post in the chat and uh, we'll make sure that uh, our panelists today have a chance to answer your questions. So the, the next one that I have uh, is sort of a curveball. We didn't talk about this uh, before, but um, and, and not that anyone here is going anywhere soon, like as in retirement or anything like that. But what advice would you give to the person who would come in and replace you, uh, whether it's a year from now or six months or who knows, um, you know, someone who would step into your shoes after you've gone through all of this. So um, Ying, why don't we start with you on that one? So I, I don't think the advice changes, right? You know, be will cognizant of your 90 days, right? Build trust, right? You know, look for those, you know, look for those key you know, key vectors where, you know, that, that the organization you're coming into, right, is just important to those, what are those pillars, right, and build trust. I, I don't think being remote um, and not having the face-to-face -face takes away from any of the need um, to do that. So, um, you know, meet your customers, right, you know, know what they're looking for, know what your measure of success is, you know, from, from the numbers perspective, but also from your customer's um, viewpoint. Right. And, you know, and just, you know, the, the one that that's always going to be true is respect the past. Every decision was made for a reason in the past. And, and you just got to assume that at that time, no matter how bad that decision looks today. Right. It was the right decision at the time. And they, everybody did the best that they can. So it's not broken. Right. You're here to make it better. So, you know, as long as respect the organization, build trust. Right. Know what your measure of goodness is and, and know who your customers measure success are. You'll be in great shape. Thank you. Great. Robin. Oh, Ying, you're more patient, but uh, <laughs> I think what I think about is, I think yeah, what Ying mentioned is the same, right? You know, it doesn't matter if there is COVID or uh, uh, post-COVID or pre-COVID, uh, whoever steps into anybody's shoes has the same challenges, right? There's nothing changes, except I think what I was thinking about in my mind was one thing that we could learn out of the COVID-19 is don't take the ideas out there, right? Because you never know right for In my case, I think the indoor positioning project was one classic where I was struggling to get a lot of people see the big, big picture need for such a platform. But I have been going at that problem for long enough when the situation arises, people feel that, okay, there is somebody who is thinking about a challenge and this might be the solution for issue, addressing that issue that you are facing now, right? So th what that translates to me is, if you are in an organization and if you have new ideas, um, as in point out, respect the culture of the organization, but don't be scared to, to put your ideas out there because you never know when the, when the time happens for that idea to be absorbed by the organization and say, okay, we are gonna go with it, right? I think that is what I will add. To, to all the other issues you have when you step into a leadership role. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Well, Frank, uh, what's your advice? Be agile. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, you know, 
Rubbing is basically the same thing. You know, you got you to respect what was going on before because you have to understand it. Sometimes you got to explain why things happened the way they did way back when so that some new people actually can understand the reasons for those decisions because a lot of times they're like, you got to be crazy what happened way back on, you know. And so you got to explain, you know, the, de the details behind it. And it helps them understand going forward, you know, why things are the way they are today. But I think, you know, and you got to understand your people. I mean, that's always the case. I mean, you know, they come up with suggestions. You got to be open to them. You can't just say, you know, I know everything. Trust me. You know, that doesn't get you anywhere. They get you into uh, them hating you, in fact. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the culture is what the culture is, and you got to enforce that culture for change. And that's what we're into right now. We're into lots and lots of change. Some people can't absorb change, and you're going to have to help them absorb change. And that's, you know, one of the things that is, you know, if I left, I'd say my, my successor, be ready for that because there's lots of people out there who don't want to change, but you're going to have to encourage them to do that in such a way that they can see why they have to do that. It actually supports what they're doing going forward as mission as well. Right. Thank you. Well, speaking of change, uh, our, we have a question from our audience, from Ann Duncan. Uh, how do you think uh, things will change when you eventually go back to the office? So who wants to start with that one? I can start. Okay. You think we're going to go back to the office, huh? <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the first question you have to answer. Uh, I don't. I think that we're never going to go back full time anymore, really, except for some people who have to be there. I mean, some people have to be there, and they have to be there to support. Uh, but I don't think that that's going to be the requirement anymore. I think it's going to be a you know you show up you know when you have to show up and you work at home when you don't have to work at home. You have to work at home. It's, it's very simple. And I think that's going to be the philosophy going forward for most people. And you know, in industry, of course, they want to hotel everybody anyway. So this was this fits right into the hoteling model that you know many corporations have gone to, where everybody has to work at home or whatever, and they come in and meet whenever they have to meet and they arrange a conference room. I think that's you know what we're going to see, you know, for like, you know, for the Air Force and the Pentagon. I mean, everybody Depending on it's so crowded, it's very difficult anyways, now it's empty. So the issue is, is what do you want to do to consolidate your workforce in such a way that they can work together, but still, you know, get everything done. And I think that's what you're going to, the new norm is going to be coming out like that. Thank you. Robin? I think one thing I was thinking about in that direction is the inclusive aspect of this change, right? Because now, since all of us have no other option than being on the Zoom, we are not leaving anybody behind. Right, but the question is if 50% of our workforce is working from home and 50% is in the office, how do we change from a CTO or a technology perspective enough capabilities in all conference rooms and everybody's desk so that they don't feel like they are missing something out, right? So that will be the, the interesting thing, what I'm thinking from a organization readiness perspective when we go back, right? How do we make sure that we can have that dispersed workforce as I was envisioning, but at the same time, if I am in the office with a couple of my team in a conference room, I don't want one of my team member who is working from home feel like he or she cannot be a part of that discussion, right? So how do we change the conference rooms to become more inclusive for people working remotely is probably one of the challenges I see from an institution perspective. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Ying, uh, you're gonna have the last word since we're down to just a, a couple few minutes here uh, before the, uh, the top of the hour. So uh, how do you think things are gonna change when people eventually go back into the office? We'll look back and, and try to remember what a conference room even was. Um, you know, I think, I think from physical layout um, across the board, right? You know, those that do need to come back to the office, right? Things will be radically different. Um, customer facing is going to be um, very different, right? Um, you know, um, things that we wouldn't think of as being customer friendly in the past would now become customer friendly, like, you know, face shields, plexiglass shields, you know, hey, we're here to protect each other and, and, and that's going to be accepted. Um, you know, there's going to be some weirdness with security, you know, how do you deal with people wearing face masks, you know, in a public space, you know, and and how do you crowd control in the public space? City halls open, you know, you have a, a hot topic, you know, some folks don't want to wear a mask, it's not mandated, is it mandated? You know, can you have a 
uh, city hall only rule over the state rule over the fed rule. i mean all of that is is going to have to work itself out but in a few years i think it'll settle into some sort of new normal but it'll be very different um you know we're government workers so it is a big question right equity is going to be a big deal right or our essential workers have to come back right you know our non-essential worker is going to have this now quote unquote privilege of working from home and not being at risk right so i think i think you know there's going to be a, a definitely an equity uh, question right um you know frank mentioned earlier you know we have a nifty app that we wrote in service now to check out equipment from the office you know so how much do you equip folks to work from home right you know when you're in the office you get an ergonomic chair you get you know accommodations right how do we offer those same accommodations in a you know in a home setting so so i think all of that you know we look back a couple of years from now i think things are just going to be different right um you know the amount of lease spaces we're going to have um, as a public entity is going to be much less right you know um just my small department alone i don't need the space that i have not by far right you know before i was probably housing about 300 folks that are purely office you know workers you know knowledge workers you know again set aside from the essential folks that are at the eoc and at the at the shop you know where we outfit the cars you know the fleet things like that now i only need probably about 25 30 spaces right you know a conference room that holds 25 is social distancing now can hold four so why would i build one of those right just do all your meetings online just forget about it and then the big thing is we have a lot to learn from private um you know, when we come back to work, you know, we're going to deal with social distancing, you know, safety protocols, PPE, inventory tracking, contact tracing. Um, you know, I can tell you that manufacturing, you know, which is a strong background for me, they haven't stopped. They've got all this figured out, right? You know, so, so you know, there's a lot that government can take from private as we move forward. Excellent. Well, thank you. So, uh, Thank you so much. We're we're out of time. Uh, we do have another question. I think that we'll just maybe handle offline. Uh, I'll email it and maybe I can distribute it to the the folks who are registered uh, for this call. But I want to thank all the all of our attendees today for uh, for sticking with us and uh, tuning in. And our panelists, Frank Ying and Robin, thank you so much for your time. Really great discussion today. And uh, we will post this on our website, agilegovleaders.org, and post it and tweet it and all those sorts of things. So again, thank you and uh, have a great day. Stay safe out there. Great. Thank you so much.